Welcome to our WSA 9 Cherry Blossom Special. I'm WSA 9 Chief Meteorologist Topper Shutt. DC's cherry blossom season is here again. The iconic sign of spring is already blooming around the district, and it won't be long before people are flocking to the tidal basin to see the puffy pink and white blossoms. And if it seems like the cherry blossoms are popping a bit earlier and earlier, well, you're right. This year's predicted peak bloom, according to the National Park Service, is between March 23rd and March 26th. We could hit that peak bloom earlier than that. And if you take a look at the dates of the most recent peak blooms, four out of the last six were in March. March 23rd last year, March 21st in 2022, and the earliest being March 20th back in 2020. Only twice in the last six years has peak bloom occurred in April. And only in 2018 did we see one later than average peak bloom. The average peak bloom, you might ask, well, that's April 4th. The latest peak bloom on record is April 18th, way back in 1958. That record is safe, and the earliest bloom was March 15th, 1990. We could come very close to that this year. So, the bottom line, if you want to see the cherry blossoms at peak bloom near the tidal basin, you better make plans sooner rather than later. Meteorologist Michaela Lucera has everything you need to know from getting there to what to wear. If you plan on checking out the cherry blossoms this year, here's a few things you need to know before you go. First things first, your outfit. You must wear your best walking shoes. The walking loop at the Tidal Basin is more than two miles long, and if you want to go check out some of the other memorials along the National Mall, you will easily add several more miles to that. In March, the average day will start in the 30s and end in the 50s, so layers are your best option. And if it's sunny, be sure to bring a hat, and sunglasses. And if it rains, a raincoat will serve you best. An umbrella can be a hassle to carry around all day. It can obstruct your view of the blossoms and they may damage low hanging branches. Finally, have a bag that can hold all your essentials. Things like water, snacks, sunscreen, and your camera. Since parking is limited at the tidal basin, you won't be able to just run back to the car to grab your essentials. Now that you're dressed, let's go over some cherry blossom etiquette. Some of the trees are more than a century old, which makes them very delicate. It's actually against the law to touch any of the cherry trees. This includes, but isn't limited to, sitting in or on the trees, touching the tree trunks, pulling on branches to get the blossoms closer to you for a photo, and pulling branches or petals off the tree to take home with you. Please do your part to keep the cherry blossoms healthy. And finally, transportation. The parking around the Tidal Basin is extremely limited. There's a good chance you'll spend more time looking for parking than you will enjoying the trees. There are parking garages that you can pay to use, but they can be pretty expensive. Other transportation options are taking the metro, a rideshare, or a taxi, renting a bike or scooter, or kicking it old school and walking. Your outfit's picked out, you're up to date on etiquette, and you figured out your transportation, which means you are ready to enjoy the cherry blossoms. From the Tidal Basin, I'm meteorologist Michaela Lucero, WUSA 9. Weather, as you might expect, plays a big role in the blooming process. Warmer temperatures can help the cherry blossoms bloom faster, while cold weather can slow them down. The National Park Service tracks six stages of the blooming cycle. The first, green bud, and that's when you can just barely see some color breaking through the tightly packed buds. The second, florets visible, when you start to see a bit more green popping through. Next is the extension of the florets. And fourth is everyone's favorite to say, peduncle elongation. That's when those buds really start to extend and you start to see some pink on the tips. The fifth stage is puffy white and the final stage is peak bloom. Now that's when 70% of the Yoshino cherry trees around the tidal basin have bloomed. Here's meteorologist Caitlin McGrath to explain how the National Park Service makes its peak bloom prediction. Predicting when the cherry trees will hit peak bloom is in many ways like forecasting the weather. There's a lot that goes into an accurate forecast and a lot that can impact the outcome. But unlike the National Park Service, we don't have a tree helping us out. There is one particular Yoshino tree that tends to run about two weeks or 10 days in advance of the, the rest of the trees around the tidal basin. It's called the indicator tree and for good reason. It does give us a reliable indicator every year of where the rest of the trees are likely to, to, to fall in the bloom cycle. But it takes a lot more than a tree to predict peak bloom. 
we're looking at the historic record. What's happened in the last several years, 10 years uh, going back? But we're also, of course, looking at the near and long range forecast. If we're expecting a warming trend over the next month, that's probably gonna influence us to call a little bit earlier. If we're expecting average or even colder temperatures, that's obviously gonna push it back a little further. And warming global temperatures have been undeniably pushing peak bloom earlier and earlier. Over the last 10 years or so, probably even a little bit longer, we are seeing the trend um, almost every year with peak bloom coming earlier than that average date of, of April 3rd or April 4th. But the bloom time of these iconic cherry trees is only one impact of climate change. Sea level rise combined with sinking seawalls around the tidal basin has led to flooding twice a day, every day. Ten years ago, that was an incident that happened a couple times a month in some places or irregularly. We're at low tide right now, but you can see the, the effects of, of all that. And that inundation of water wreaks havoc on tree roots. And as we look down this line here, you notice there is a huge gap between here and, and about 100 yards away where there are no cherry trees. They've all either had to be cut down or have died because of all the water that's coming, coming over the seawalls. Construction is set to start this summer to rebuild the seawalls that have sunk three to four feet over the years. When that work is done, we can replant the trees and they'll have a, a much better chance of survival. A new walkway will also be constructed for visitors to enjoy. Exciting project. It's going to take a couple of years, uh, but looking forward to the positive impact on the tidal basin and the trees when it's done. This chart shows us the peak bloom dates for the past 20 years, and it shows us that there have only been five years out of the last 20 where peak bloom was later than the average peak bloom date of April 4th. The rest all earlier than average, and we have to go back to 2018 for the last time peak bloom was later than average, and even then it was just by one day on April 5th. Now let's talk about how long the peak bloom can last. The National Park Service says Yoshino cherries can last for several days when they're in peak bloom. Now calm weather can help extend the bloom. Remember wind and rain while well, they're just the enemy. OK, and also something to remember. Do not pick the blossoms or climb the trees because that could severely damage them. And actually the National Park Service could write you a ticket. The National Cherry Blossom Festival grows larger and attracts more tourists to D.C. every year. What was once a small ceremony has become a month-long event. According to its president, the Cherry Blossom Festival attracts 1.5 million people to D.C., bringing in about $150 million every year. Meteorologist Michaela Lucero shows us how the city is getting ready. Every year, thousands of people flock to the Tidal Basin to enjoy the Cherry Blossom Festival. But did you know there are tons of Cherry Blossom themed events outside of the Tidal Basin area that you can enjoy? To learn more, I spoke with the president of the National Cherry Blossom Festival, Diana Mayhew. Our goal with the National Cherry Blossom Festival has really been to take that beautiful celebration of the Tidal Basin beyond the Tidal Basin and throughout Washington's downtown into all eight wards of the city and actually even into the region. The National Cherry Blossom Festival consists of four weeks full of exciting events. From the annual staples like the Kite Festival and the Parade to some of the newer attractions like the After Hours exhibits at the National Gallery of Art and the brand new art projection at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. There are so many special things like that to do off of the, from the Tidal Basin and the mall. There are also restaurants that partner with the festival to provide you with a very cherry dining experience. We have more than 80 restaurants that are participating with us in our Cherry Picks program, showcasing a specialty cocktail or an entree or a dessert. And you can go and just experience the, the cuisine of Washington, D.C. And the party doesn't stop when the sun goes down. We do have a cherry night celebration where we're really focusing on the nightlife of Washington, D.C. with Metro Bar and Dirty Habit and Wonder Garden. D.C. is also known for some of its luxury hotels, like the Waldorf Astoria, which invites everyone, hotel guest or not, to come enjoy their cherry blossom experience. From a cherry blossom afternoon tea, from experience at just the lobby, or to have a, a, an experience at Bazaar by Jose Andres or lunch, dinner, it's a, it's a space that is open for everybody. The National Cherry Blossom Festival helps bring in thousands of tourists every year from all over the world, boosting the local economy. The National Cherry Blossom Festival is an economic engine for Washington, D.C. in springtime. And we draw more than 1.5 million people each year. 
and showcasing some of the best that D.C. has to offer. I'm meteorologist Michaela Lucero, WUSA 9. This year's National Cherry Blossom Festival runs from March 20th all the way to April 14th, and there's plenty to do over those three plus weeks. The Cherry Blossom Festival kicks off with the official opening ceremony on Saturday, March 23rd. And the always popular Cherry Blossom Kite Festival takes place Saturday, March 30th on the grounds of the Washington Monument. Other signature events include Petapalooza, featuring live music, activities, and fireworks at the Capitol's riverfront. That happens Saturday, April 6th. And the annual National Cherry Blossom Parade marches down Constitution Avenue on Saturday, April 13th. There will be floats, balloons, and marching bands, performances by the Sugar Hill Gang and others, and appearances by special guests Mickey and Minnie Mouse. There are about 3,700 cherry trees on the National Mall. The pink and white Yoshino cherry blossoms are just one of a dozen types, and they all don't bloom at the same time. And you can find many of the varieties away from the tidal basin. Meteorologist Michaela Lucero explains the differences. Did you know there are 12 different types of cherry trees scattered across DC? If you head out to the Cherry Blossom Festival, the most common tree you'll see is the Yoshino cherry. This tree represents approximately 70% of the total number of cherry trees in the park, according to the National Park Service. These trees can grow to 50 feet high and can be spotted by their white flowers and almond scent. The next most common is the Kwanzaa cherry. This one makes up for about 13% of the cherry trees you see on the mall in the tidal basin. You can identify this one by its bushel of large pink petals that are usually in bunches of three to five. Certain cherry trees have become increasingly rare to see here on the National Mall. Take Cimensis cherry, Akebono cherry, Autumn Flowering cherry, Weeping cherry, and the Usuzumi cherry all represent 5% or less of the trees in the park. The most uncommon trees make up less than 1% each of the cherry blossoms you see here on the Mall. Sargent cherry, Shiro Fujen cherry, Okame cherry, and the Fugenzo cherry. And then there's the blossoms on your block. You can find Yoshino, Kwanzaa, Okame, and others blooming across the district. If you want to figure out the exact kind of cherry tree that's on your street, we have a guide on our website. You can see all the different types of cherry trees in the park and across DC at WUSA9.com. Okay, for folks who don't want to venture into downtown DC, there are several other places to view cherry blossoms away from the National Mall. The National Arboretum in Northeast DC is a home to a wide variety of cherry blossoms. Several different types of cherry blossoms are located inside Congressional Cemetery. Bethesda's Kenwood neighborhood is a great place to view the blossoms without the big crowds. There is also the walled at Bishop's Garden at National Cathedral. And Cherry Hill, located in Dunbarton Oaks in Georgetown, also has a mixture of cherry blossoms. Now, if you want to go to the Tidal Basin during peak bloom, you'll see no shortage of folks taking pictures of the cherry blossoms from professional photographers to the average person with a cell phone camera. Everyone is looking for that perfect shot. Well, meteorologist Michaela Lucero spoke to an expert for some tips. It's no secret that everybody wants to capture the perfect cherry blossom picture, but with things like large crowds and bright sun, it can make capturing your memories a little bit harder. I reached out to one of our top WSA 9 weather watchers, Chris Vacuda, to get three tips on how to snap the perfect cherry blossom shot. First, the best time to take photos is in the morning before too much dust gets in the air and large crowds become unmanageable. Second, for best color and detail, try using low angled shots and golden lighting. Finally, if you're using your cell phone, Fakuda recommends using the panoramic setting to capture all of your surroundings in one shot. So there you go, three tips to help you snap the perfect cherry blossom shots. From the Tidal Basin, I'm meteorologist Michaela Lucero, WUSA 9. Along with springtime and all of those cherry blossoms also comes pollen. That's why you'll see many people reaching for tissues and rubbing their eyes. Climate change is not only affecting the cherry blossoms, it's also affecting seasonal allergies as well. And it all comes down to warming global temperatures and the impact on the growing season. Longer periods of freeze free days means that trees and plants have more time to flower and release that agitating pollen. A recent study revealed that the pollen season in North America became longer by an average of 20 
20 days and more intense with a 21% increase in pollen concentrations from 1990 to 2018. And people are definitely feeling the effects. I never had them when I was younger and then like two years ago I started getting like watery eyes and like a little stuffy nose. Situation. Nothing crazy, so yeah. I feel like last year specifically was the first year I was like this feels a lot worse. A lot of drippy, drippy nose, all that fun stuff. It was awful. <laughs> Symptoms for people with seasonal allergies aren't only getting worse, they're starting earlier. One of the trends that I'm seeing is patients saying that their allergy symptoms are starting earlier and earlier. And I hear this every year. Neelu Tumala is an ear, nose and throat physician at George Washington University's School of Medicine and the co-director of the Climate Health Institute and says increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is thought to be one of the main contributing factors to higher pollen levels. When you have increased CO2 and have higher levels of pollen, of course, you're going to have worsening pollen allergy symptoms because there's more pollen to deal with. Studies have also shown that the pollen itself is more allergenic, meaning that it produces more symptoms. And so pollen now tends to produce more symptoms of, again, sneezing, nasal congestion, itchy, watery eyes, post-nasal drainage than pollen previously. If you're prone to seasonal allergies, you may want to start taking steps now to alleviate symptoms. Oral allergy medications and eye drops should be used on days when symptoms are bothersome, but effective nasal sprays need more lead up time. We usually like to start these sprays in patients about two weeks before the onset of pollen allergy season. So now that tree pollen levels are already high, if you have not started and these are medications that you normally take to manage your pollen allergy symptoms, I do recommend going ahead and starting them or touching base with your healthcare provider to make sure that they're the right thing to move forward with. Scientists are also seeing pollen appearing in new geographic regions. That's related to changes in temperature and precipitation patterns. When you have trees able to grow in new regions, then you're introducing new pollen to that region and people who are otherwise not sensitized to pollen may now become sensitized and develop allergy symptoms. There are simple actions you can take this time of the year to mitigate the impacts of pollen. First and foremost, check the pollen count. You can always find the latest pollen measurements on our WUSA 9 app or website. On days when pollen is high, it might just be best to stay inside, especially if it's windy and the pollen will be blowing around. The best time to get outside and avoid allergens is after a good rain. Keep your windows closed when you're driving and at home. Avoid mowing the lawn, pulling weeds and other outdoor activities that can stir up pollen and remove clothes that you've worn outside and shower to rinse that pollen from your skin and hair. And don't forget about your pets. Give them a bath to keep them clean as well. I'm meteorologist Caitlin McGrath, WUSA 9. The National Cherry Blossom Festival is not just about cherry blossoms. It's a celebration of the friendship between the people of the United States and Japan. And its origin more than a century ago reads like a fairy tale. Meteorologist Michaela Lucera takes us back in time. Let me tell you a story about Bella the Blossom. Bella is a tiny cherry blossom in Tokyo, Japan. In 1909, she's scooped up, and little does she know, she's in for the biggest adventure of her life. Bella and 2,000 of her closest cherry blossom buds are headed to Washington, D.C. The mayor of Tokyo, Yukio Ozaki, generously donated 2,000 cherry blossoms to the United States to symbolize friendship. The First Lady, Helen H. Taft, gladly accepted the blossoms and intended to plant them near the Potomac. But here, our story takes a sad turn. When Bella and her bud friends arrived in D.C., many of them had gotten sick along the way and would have to be destroyed. President William Howard Taft gave the order to burn the diseased trees and wrote to Japanese officials telling them the devastating news. Thankfully, a few of the original buds could be saved, and that included Bella. Saddened by the loss of her friends, Bella needed some good news, and that's just what she got. Japanese officials sent over 3,020 new cherry blossoms, thousands of new buddies for Bella. On March 26, 1912, the new trees arrived, and they were planted the very next day. First Lady Taft and Viscountess Chinda, wife of the Japanese ambassador, planted the first two cherry blossoms along the tidal basin in the first ever Cherry Blossom Festival. Those trees still stand today. Over the next eight years, trees would be planted along the Tidal Basin and in East Potomac Park. And that's exactly where Bella would find her forever home. 
If you head out to see the cherry blossoms, here are a few historical markers to look out for, each representing a rededication of friendship between the U.S. and Japan. This Japanese stone lantern, located in West Potomac Park, is more than three centuries old and is lit to mark the start of the festival. This lantern has a twin in Ueno Park in Tokyo, Japan. You can also look for the Japanese pagoda, located on the southwest bank of the tidal basin. This was a gift given by the mayor of Yokohama back in 1957. Over the years, thousands of new trees have been planted, and some of the originals were even sent back to Japan to help restore their forests. If you'd like more information on this year's Cherry Blossom Festival, head over to WSA9.com for the details. On the National Mall and Tidal Basin, I'm meteorologist Michaela Lucero, WUSA9. Walking isn't the only way to enjoy the cherry blossoms in D.C. If you're looking to set sail, well, there's a cherry blossom cruise right down the Potomac River. The 45 minute boat ride includes a D.C. history lesson and provides scenic views of the cherry blossoms and Washington's most famous landmarks. And if you don't want to fight the crowd, you can check out the cherry blossoms from the comfort of your own home. The Trust for the National Mall has partnered with EarthCam to stream live video of the Tidal Basin from the roof of the Salamander Hotel in southwest D.C. We also have that link on our website, WSA9.com. Just scan the QR code on your screen and get our complete cherry blossoms guide. It has everything you need to know to make your plans to celebrate the cherry blossom season. Thanks for joining us for our WSA9 cherry blossom special. I'm Chief Meteorologist Topper Shutt. I hope you get a chance to enjoy what our beautiful city has to offer this spring.